Hi everyone and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited about today's presentation featuring experts Al Gresh, Vice President of Healthcare Strategy, and Rick Jocelyn, Senior Advisor Healthcare Strategy, both of Accruent. Al and Rick will discuss healthcare technology management and how it extends well beyond just the typical break fix function. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Accruent. Accruent is the world's leading provider of intelligent solutions for the built environment and continues to set new expectations for how organizations can use data to manage their facilities and assets. With office locations across the globe, Accruent serves more than 10,000 customers in more than 150 countries. For more information, please visit accruent.com. A few announcements before we get started. MD Expo strives to provide healthcare technology management professionals with a unique, intimate, and rewarding conference second to none. Please join us in Las Vegas on November 1st and 2nd for the 2021 MD Expo. Please visit mdexposhow.com for details, registration, and our steps to a safe and clean meeting environment. While you're there, please make sure to sign up for our newsletter so you always have the most up-to-date information. Let's give one lucky attendee the opportunity to win one of our newly designed Webinar Wednesday shirts by answering the following question. In what city and state is the Accruent Corporate Headquarters located? You can find the answer by visiting our sponsor's website. Please use the question feature on the GoToWebinar dashboard to submit your answer. As always, today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. I'll have more details for you at the end of the webinar. We'll wrap up today with a live Q&A session. If you have a question for the presenters, please submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the questions feature. We'll get through as many questions as time allows. As I mentioned earlier, our speakers today are Al Gresh and Rick Jocelyn. Al, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that introduction. Thank you, Rick, for joining me today. And thank you to all of you for joining this session that will hopefully provide some ideas uh, for ventures that could really benefit your department and your organization outside of the typical HTM role. So let's, uh, let's jump in and get started. Our agenda for today is we're gonna answer the question, why? Why would you wanna uh, undertake something like this? Um, both and, and, and as part of that, we'll talk about the financial impact, uh, the value and recognition that, that uh, could be garnered for your department, uh, the opportunity to increase efficiency, not only for clinical staff, but your own staff. We'll talk about the how, how to do it. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through the, uh, at a high level, um, the creation of a, of a business plan uh, some questions to ask on, on how to build that out, um, assessing your current state, uh, developing ideal process and identifying gaps, creating the plan and work the, working the plan. And that's, um, that, that's pretty common uh, methodology for building out any kind of, of new uh, functionality or process uh, within your organization. And then we'll, we'll finish up with, with the what, Rick, We'll jump in and offer up some examples of processes and how this is handled in, or how, how it can be handled within a, a CMMS platform. And then I'll close out by sharing some uh, real life results from um, some of our customers that have gone down this path, as well as some of my own uh, experiences. So I think to start out, um, I, I'd like to uh, help help you understand exactly what, what do I mean by request management. Um, hopefully this is a this is representative of what your process looks like for the life cycle of, of a request for service on a, on a piece of medical equipment. And you'll see we'll, we'll kind of walk through it. It's a it's a nice closed loop process where the the uh, clinical staff 
um, makes a request either online or via mobile device or, or via phone, and a service request is created. And then you determine where, where does that request go. Um, if you if you're handling uh, any anything within your group that's beyond uh, just general biomed, uh, if you've got any specialty areas with people with uh, higher level ex expertise such as imaging, you know who do you want that request to go to? And then you'll validate whether or not that item is under contract. Uh, you'll go ahead and schedule the the, the call, um, and then it'll it'll go to the right person, whether it's uh, one of your staff uh, technicians or a, a third party that's responsible for delivering that service. And then you'll go through the normal uh, process of of handling that service event. Uh, if if you need parts, uh, or or if you need to send the piece uh, piece of equipment out. You know that's what the asset logistics are, and then um, you go ahead and execute that service, uh, record all of the relevant information in your CMMS, and you complete the service request. And if you follow the the dotted lines that go back to the the requester, you'll see that there's communication back to that person throughout the process um, to keep them informed about what's happening. They understand and and uh, what what they can expect relative to that service. And so when I talk about request management, it's just an expansion of that process into other clinical needs. Um, so you'll see the first one there, HTM service request, but it, they could use the same process to request equipment, uh, a bed to uh, request uh, HFM service. Uh, any of these other things, and, and literally this this list of things that you could make as, as part of this process is, you know, unlimited. Um, and, and so uh, for the clinician, what that creates is a single pane of glass that they can access to request anything and make that request, under, get acknowledgement that the request was received, know that it, it's it's being assigned uh, and taken care of and, and have an expectation of when that thing will be delivered. And uh, at the end of the day, what it does is it ensures that the clinical staff is spending as much of their time as possible at the bedside, taking care of patients, as as they can, and so that that's what I that's what I am am referring to when I talk about request management. So why would I want to do this? Um, let's let's talk about um, the 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 financial uh, status of of healthcare as it it, is, it exists today. Um, Pre-COVID operating margins, according to Becker's Healthcare Financials, was between 1.6 and 1.7 percent, uh, pretty razor thin. And uh, in that same report from Becker's, they expressed that uh, two and a half percent is considered sustainable. So, you know, even pre-COVID uh, operating margins weren't where they needed to be. During the worst part of the pandemic the margins dropped to negative 3%. That's not good. When If you've got negative operating margins, um, you're losing money, that, that's not sustainable. Um, in a September 2021 report, so uh, just last month from uh, Kaufman Hall, some of the, the key uh, year-to-date industry uh, numbers versus uh, what existed in, in 2019, uh, median change in operating margin was down 2.9%. Adjusted discharges was down 4.8%. ER visits was down 11%. Gross operating revenue was actually up 9.6%, which sounds like uh, like good news, except that the total expense per adjusted discharge was up 16.6%. So we are now going on like the fifth year in a row where expenses outpaced revenue. And, and again, that is absolutely not sustainable. So if you have an opportunity to help your organization reduce those expenses, uh, why, why wouldn't you? Um, 
you know, the, the, the dollars that are going out the door uh, every, every month for uh, equipment rentals, the, the unnecessary capital that's, that's uh, uh, being uh, acquired because there's this uh, perception of shortage. Um, and, and let's face it, uh, for, for every one of those devices that is acquired, uh, you have to maintain it. Right, and so your your service expenses are are going to go up unnecessarily as well. So these are all uh, areas where you can help your organization reduce the cost. Let's talk about uh, value and and recognition. So um, outside consulting comparisons, I'm sure many of you have experienced uh, the situation where your organization hires a consultant come to come in and assess your operations. I distinctly recall, um, oh, and by the way, uh, I, I love sitting across the table from a, a 23 year old uh, that, that has never worked in the industry telling me how I should run my business. Uh, and there's nothing I like better. But I, I recall specifically an instance where um, uh, at one organization I was at, we had a strategic alliance agreement with GE. And as part of that, we got free consulting services. So they, they had uh, that group come in and assess our department. And a couple of uh, statistics that they, they drew on was, uh, first of all, that the number of technicians that I had per license bed was higher than the national average. Okay, so uh, all right. Well, some of that was done on purpose, right? I had insourced a bunch of work um, that most people outsource, and so yes, of course, I had a higher number of techs per license bed, but I was saving the organization money. But then, like three pages later, they called out the fact that the number of devices per license bed was also higher than the national average. Um, and I, so when I went through this report with, with my executive leadership, I said, you know what, I agree. We, we do have more staff than we need. Uh, we do have more uh, equipment than we need. But, you know, guess what? First of all, uh, if we have more equipment, I need to maintain it, okay? So this was an opportunity for me. I said, work with me to reduce the amount of equipment that we have and together we can reduce expenses. And so that's that's the path that we went down. Um, but it, it's also about uh, problem solving at a higher level. So another, um, about the same time, I was in a, a capital meeting with some nursing uh, executives and the, the nursing VP at one of our hospitals uh, complained that um, they don't have enough infusion pumps that, um, and, and, and other uh, pieces of mobile medical equipment that her, her nurses are having to chase these things down. And, and again, it's taking them away from the bedside. Well, it, it, I mean, I, I know what our inventory was and I know what the, the, the uh, volumes were for that organization. And, the, you know, they were in directly in, in line with what we had elsewhere. Uh, so they didn't need more of them. What they did need was to manage what they had. And so um, after the meeting, I, I suggested to, to Diane that, that we, we work collectively to solve that issue. Um, and along with that, we would, we would be able to increase her staff's efficiency. And in the back of my mind, I knew that we could also increase my staff's efficiency because if we implemented a program where we knew where things were and, and could get them to her staff, then my, my team would also know where that stuff was. And then when it came time to do plan maintenance, uh, and it's especially important now as we're expected to hit 100% um, completion rates, uh, that would help me at the same time it, it would help them. Um, HAI is hospital acquired in infections. Um, here's another area where um, what, what often happens in situations where there's a perceived shortage of equipment is that um, 
staff will will have a tendency to hoard equipment and keep it on the floor as I, I've heard several stories of uh, nurses actually hiding pumps up in the ceiling tiles um, I, and, and it sounds ridiculous but I actually saw it uh, myself and um, in in one of the organizations where I, I went through this process that I'm, I'm going to cover with you all today um, I invited the uh, manager of infection control to come along uh, with us as we assessed current state and I, I thought her head was going to explode when she when she saw uh, firsthand um, how stuff was being processed or not being processed uh, and and cleaned in the manner that it need to be cleaned and, and think about that in the environment that we're in today with with a pandemic right um, that that's even more vitally important than it's than it's ever been so it also ensures compliance with cleaning and sterilization processes so there's a ton of reasons why uh, you shouldn't uh, engage or could engage in this process to bring greater value to your organization and, and help out your clinicians um, I, I'm on the uh, uh, healthcare Technology Leadership Committee with Amy, and one of the documents that uh, we created or, or guides that we created this past year was uh, entitled Seen by the C-Suite, and it's a guide to emphasizing your value. And I just wanted to call out some of the pieces that I think are germane to this discussion that were in that guide. Uh, the first is to utilize Amy's HTM Levels Guide. If you're not familiar with that, uh, there, we're on the third edition of that. The first one, I think, was released in 2012, the second in, in uh, 2016, and then they just last year came out with uh, the third uh, edition of that. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a great tool to evaluate your department using, uh, using that uh, online self-assessment tool. Um, and it'll identif help identify for you ways that you can uh, move up to the next level. There's uh, three different uh, levels with that. There's um, fundamental, uh, progressive, and advanced. And, and I'll show you, I'll share with you some of the things that I that I pulled uh, from that. The second thing here is to develop a five-year business plan. And um, you know I. I, I talk at length about how to do that in a, in a session that um, I, I put on in a, at a couple of MD expos, and uh, I think most recently was in Dallas. So if you're interested in that, um, you know you, you can you can likely uh, request that from uh, Tech Nation and, and uh, get access to that. But um, it, it's it's using the levels guide as, as as a guide to assess your current state and and establish goals for how to improve and then create a five-year business plan for your department and and what we're talking about today could easily be part of that business plan next one is to create an htm dashboard of key impactful metrics um, i had a lot of them that included things like uh, uptime on major modalities these are the things that your executives um, really are interested in because those, those are the revenue generators for for your organization but uh, to quantify metrics and understand the impact on uh, your competency training impact on cost and savings generated impact on patient care so see, these are some of the things that uh, what we're talking about today are directly relevant to and then the last thing uh, create a list of quantifiable HTM program deliverables that impact other departments. And certainly this would fall into that category, ways that you could um, help uh, your, your uh, clinical department solve this, this issue of not having what they need uh, when they need it. And it, it's part of uh, taking care of, of the patients that we all serve. And, and, and to me, it's always been part of asset management is, is making sure that uh, our, our frontline caregivers have what they need when they need it. So these were some excerpts that I took from the HTM uh, Levels Guide, the, the second edition of it, um, and, and these were the same in, in the third edition, but uh, in the level two uh, of progressive, it states the HTM department works with clinical staff to understand their needs and ident identify appropriate technologies. Now, when it's talking about technologies, it's it's not just uh, capital equipment. Uh, it, it's also what what other technologies are available 
to help your your clinical staff uh, meet the needs of, of of the patient, and and us as the managers of technology should uh, play a key role in that. Um, the next one, HTM program has effective working relationships with clinical departments, and and, and hopefully that that's the case with with all of you that you've got very very strong. Um, relationships with those departments, but I think as part of that, how you optimize that relationship is to let those folks know that you're as invested in their success as as they are. Um, I, I often talked about uh, when I, when I was uh, working in the field um, that I didn't do business with vendors; I did business with partners, people that were as invested in my success as, as I was, and, and this isn't any different. And if we move to the advanced uh, level three uh, program, it says HTM program integrates risk management and quality assurance into HTM. And certainly what we're talking about today um, feeds into that. And then lastly, the HTM program manages medical technologies throughout the entire equipment life cycle from uh, pre-purchase assessment and evaluation through uh, purchasing and installation acceptance, repair and maintenance, decommissioning and disposal, but you know also making sure that the technology is available to staff when they need it, um, I feel is, is is part of that. So let's let's move into the how. As as I mentioned um, earlier, um, I I did this session, um, and Jennifer, if you're still listening, this is the the title of that session creating compelling messaging and value for the, the, the C-suite. And the objectives for that session was, first of all, to create a, a compelling business plan, and, and it goes through um, how to do that. Um, deliver more than the standard PM break fix function, help your executives solve their cost challenges, and lastly, become recognized as someone your executive leadership team can count on for innovative solutions. And um, you know, I, I, I've often talked about this that uh, you know, if, if we have an opportunity to do something that really isn't uh, part of the the, the typical uh, HTM um, responsibility and, and, and processes, uh, I, I, I really never said no to anything that was uh, part of the, the asset management function, um, as long as I was given the, the resources, both the, the staffing and, and the financial resources to complete that work successfully. And, and that all uh, plays into uh, the creating a business plan to ensure that, that you get that. By no means am I intimating that you take on additional work for your department without the staff and, and the budget to, to do so. Um, that's just a recipe for disaster. So one thing I, I wanna mention here too, uh, as it relates to e equipment uh, distribution, um, RTLS is not a silver bullet. I have seen so many organizations invest in RTLS technology and fail to develop a solid process behind it. Um, you know, who, how do things get requested? How do they get delivered? And, um, you know, what is what is the the day-to-day -day process behind that? Um, and understand that dots on a map by themselves without a, a process is not going to solve your problems. Uh, and like I said, I've seen way too many organizations uh, do exactly that and, 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 and end up wasting a whole lot of money in, in that investment. Instead, what I often talk about is the three-legged stool to success, and that's people, process, and technology. And, and one example of that is when back when we were looking at RTLS technology, uh, before we went ahead and made that investment, um, we evaluated the, the the process and the department that was responsible for delivering that service and how they were doing things and determined that um, for for some of the, the challenges that they were seeing that um, a passive RFID technology would, would do the job 
with some uh, well-placed readers. Um, so uh, an example is, is uh, a, a lot of you, I'm sure, are, are losing uh, telemetry transmitters. And so, so how does that happen? Well, the, the, the process for, um, for collecting up those, those transmitters at, at uh, the uh, end of a patient's stay is, is often not very consistent. And so those things get rolled up in the linens and, and thrown down the, the laundry chutes. And so um, we were able to tackle that with some, um, some passive RFID tags on the transmitters and some readers at, at uh, key points like uh, where the, the laundry goes down so that we could identify uh, when those things uh, went where they weren't supposed to go. Um, and you know that, that, that's, that's pretty important when you consider that a passive RFID tag is about a dollar a tag versus uh, 60 to 80 dollars a tag for uh, an, an active uh, RFID tag. So again, um, make sure that you understand what the process is and what can be addressed through process before you try applying technology. I'll go back to what I said, there are many organizations that threw away a lot of money uh, investing in an RTL, RTLS system without a good process behind it, and it, it failed miserably. Uh, in, the, in these sessions, I, I always like to share resources that, that uh, I've leaned into uh, to help with some of the work that, that I've done. And one of those is this uh, successful business plan, Secret, Secrets and Strategies by uh, Rhonda Abrams. And, um, you know, this is available on Amazon for a little over $100, but, uh, you know, you can, you can purchase the used ones that they have available for about $25. Uh, the, the one that I bought, uh, I got at half price books, which by the way, are, are still around for about 13. So, um, it, you know, things like this, uh, these resources are great investments to uh, help you build out a, a, a solid uh, business plan. And I, I know this was written for a, a small business, for a startup. But I've said many, many times that if, if you want to be optimally successful in this industry, you need to run your department like a business. And that's, that's exactly uh, what, what I did in, in the, the organizations that I ran. And so the, the plan components of this typically includes an executive summary. And one thing I want to call out here is the executive summary you write last. You, you do the research. Uh, that you need in all these other areas, and then you summarize what your plan is. And essentially, uh, so it, I mean, it's, you do your analysis and trends, your risk assessment, assessment, you know, what risks exist for the organization. And I called out a couple of them here, right? The, the, the risks are nurses aren't going to get what they need when, when they need it. They're going to be walking around looking for stuff that's going to take time away from the bedside. Uh, the uh, infection control aspects of it, um, but then develop your your operational plan uh, and your technology plan, uh, management and organization. How are you going to set up this this uh, function? Um, who's going to be responsible to do what? And then uh, create the development milestones and exit plan because uh, people are going to want to know that if if you're if does, this doesn't go the way that you intended it to go, then what What then? What is your exit plan? Because we're not going to just continue throwing money at something that isn't going to deliver results. And then certainly the financials. Um, so in a nutshell, um, it, it's, a, it's a summary of here's what I propose to do. Uh, here is how I propose to do it. Uh, here are the benefits that it will bring. Uh, here's what it will cost, and here's the timeline for payback. And if you include the, all of those things in, a, in an executive summary, you stand a very, very good chance of having this this move forward and, and getting support and buy-in. And you know, I'll just tell you that typically these things are developed uh, to to target investors. Uh, to convince them that this is um, a business venture worth in, investing in. But if you think about it, your finance and executive um, leadership 
are, are those investors, right? Um, so you need to follow the same type of a of a process and platform in presenting this to them. So you need to ask some questions, and 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 I don't I don't expect anyone to do this alone. Uh, you need to engage with your your clinical leadership. Uh, and going back to the example that I uh, cited at, at uh, one of my hospitals, I started with the nursing VP um, and, and got her support uh, to solve a problem that she, was, uh, she and her staff were seeing every day. And it starts with this question, is your staff consistently getting what they need to take care of their patients uh, when they need it? Uh, by the way, I love asking questions that I already know the answer to. And in most cases, that answer is going to be absolutely not. Another question is, okay, then what would ideal state look like? Um, and, and a lot of times it's, it's going to take, uh, you know, actually going to the department where this is, is, uh, is being done or expected to be done and looking at what the current process is. And, and from that, um, you'll be able to readily identify uh, fail points and, and where it's it's not working. Uh, and again, I'll go back to that um, that that uh, request uh, the 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 workflow or the process flow for a typical request. And if you were to follow that same methodology in in doing any of this work, I guarantee you that it would work a uh, hundred times better and solve a, a lot of these problems. So it, then, then it's a matter of sitting, also sitting down with your, your uh, finance and materials management folks and asking these questions. Uh, what is your current annual spend for equipment rentals? Uh, I will tell you that um, at, at the, the time that, that uh, we, we did implement um, an, an RTLS solution at our flagship hospital, we were about to we were about to acquire an entirely new fleet of infusion pumps. It was about over 1,300 of them. And I, I, I knew from um, other meetings that I was involved in that there was a significant amount of spend on uh, pump rentals every, every month. And the, the idea uh, that nursing had was, well, with this, with this purchase, uh, we'll just buy, uh, you know, 20% more pumps than, than, than we need, and then we'll have enough. And you know, having been in this, in this field as, as long as I, I had been, um, I, I knew that that wasn't true. Um, what it meant was that there was just going to be a higher level of hoarding. There were just gonna be more pumps that you didn't know where they were. Um, and you, your, your equipment rentals a year down the road were gonna be every bit as much as they were at that point in time. And so, um, again, I pulled together nursing leadership, finance, and um, the, the, the site uh, CEO and, and made this proposal that instead of spending this extra money on, on capital and on equipment rentals, you know, let's invest in, in this technology because if we don't do that, then uh, two days after these uh, pumps come in, we won't know where half of them are. And I made some commitments to them that part of this plan was to increase our pump utilization from 42%, which by the way is about industry average, industry average for uh, uh, pump utilization and pump vendors themselves will tell you that it's it's about 40%. Um, and, and that's acceptable, apparently. Um, I didn't think it was. Uh, so my, my goal was to increase pump utilization from 42% to 62%. And I intended to do that in three months time in order to um, ensure the payback uh, on, on uh, that investment. And we were able to do that. Um, it's just, if you have a good process in place uh, and where you need technology to support and sustain it, to employ that technology. But then um, at the time, the, the money that was going out the door for, for pump rentals alone 
was over a hundred thousand dollars and that was just at that one site so there's a, a ton of opportunity there and then once again what would ideal state look like so you know as part as part of your evaluation and, and, and business plan you know have some ideas around that but then have that discussion with your finance and materials management folks and say if i can if i could do this uh, in, in the optimal manner is that something that you would support and if you can show them what the financial impact of that would be especially now uh, you know, given the, the financial state of healthcare, uh, I, I don't know too many people that are going to um, turn that down. And then lastly, what's our current annual capital spend for mobile medical equipment? Um, you know, and, and, and again, if, 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 if there's a perception of shortage, then the idea is that if I buy more of these, then we'll have what we need and we won't have to rent. And, and that's almost never the, the case if you don't have a good process for managing uh, what, what you have. And if you do have a good process for managing what you have, you likely won't need that, um, that equipment. Uh, so just going back to the example that I cited where, um, you know, nursing, uh, contended that, it, that we were going to buy extra pumps, and so we wouldn't we wouldn't we wouldn't need to rent. Um, and and I th they weren't willing to um, cut the the order or lessen the order uh, because I at the time I hadn't proven anything. Uh, and so I said, well, well, how about this? We, we happened to be building a new hospital at the time. And in, in our industry, this, this happens fairly frequently. And the timing of it was such that I said, okay, if I, if I do that, if in the next three months, I prove that we can, um, we can increase our utilization to 62%, then we won't need those extra pumps. Would you be agreeable to then using those extra pumps for that new facility that we're building and they said well yeah absolutely so that's exactly what we did uh, and then from there once we demonstrated success with the pumps it's like okay what else what else and, and it was interesting because that that next thing that came up as far as what else was uh, telemetry transmitters and i said well hold on again it goes back to people process technology uh, at, at this hospital, we had six telemetry units, uh, four of which never, ever lost transmitters, two lost transmitters all the time. So I said, before we go spend money on RFID tags, let's figure out what these um, departments that aren't losing them are doing that the other two departments aren't doing. and and apply those processes and see if we can fix it through process and and um, for the most part we were able to do that so rick I, i'm going to pass it off to you and rick's going to cover um, how this can be implemented in a uh, cmms well thanks i'll appreciate that um so with request management in, in effect what you're doing is you're centralizing the request process, at least the, the beginning of it. Um, a lot of facilities, a lot of organizations that I've visited over the years, you know, one of the slow points, one of the one of the, the issues that cause pain to the nursing staff and others is not knowing where to go to ask for what they need. Okay. So by looking at a, a centralized uh, request management, a centralized location for everything that anyone would need you're basically combining this all together okay um you're you're bringing in your cmms and non-cmms launch points um you know you, you you might have that for maintenance but you might have uh your know, housekeeping requests on this page as well some materials management uh, conference rooms but in effect what you're doing is eliminating the time wasted by the staff trying to find out how to ask a question okay um, some of the best in class are picture-based so 
as you can see on the on the graph there, you know, you get used to knowing that that picture is for equipment service. Um, for this picture, it's for linens. Uh, for that picture, it's EVS. Um, and for the most part, this becomes browser independent. So you can do it on a mobile device, you can do it on a desktop, a tablet, a phone. Um, it really allows the the organization to eliminate any lost um, lost time, become more efficient. But more importantly, a lot of times, 10, 15% of needs don't go asked because people don't know how to ask for, for help on them. And, and a centralized request management system would really eliminate that. Next. Uh, so uh, continuing what Al had mentioned earlier, um, you know, there's a workflow. There's, there's a process for request management. You know, a request is made from a centralized area. Um, that process includes routing to the proper application. You know, if you're making a purchase request, it's got to go to that department. If it's an IT request, it's got to go to that uh, application, uh, EVS, CMMS, uh, space management, you name it. All that's built into that request management portal. It's when they click the button, it knows what to do with the request. Now, then the request is created, it's assigned, it's distributed, it's completed, and throughout this process, notifications are made automatically, even down to when it's completed. So you're keeping your customer informed uh, and your team is being able to do what they need to do, but your customers are being uh, up, uh, updated on the progress of it. Next. Um, and some real world examples of, of how these requests might look. Um, you know, obviously you'll have HTM service requests. This is normally used for equipment uh, issues and it could be on any piece of equipment in your inventory. Um, there are versions for loaned equipment, so something that, that you may not own as an organization, but's in your environment of care. But basically you're asking for who, what, when, where, um, so that your team can get that routed correctly and corrected. Um, equipment distribution should be part of this request management portal. Um, you know, a certain staff member or a team needs certain equipment. They need certain quantities of it. They need it into a certain space. Uh, so your request uh, management portal, that portal should have the ability to also request equipment distribution. Next. Uh, a lot of times you get new inventory. So uh, as I mentioned, a doctor might bring in a piece of equipment. Um, a patient might bring in a patient-owned equipment. You need a, a centralized process for at least getting that data into your CMMS. Uh, regulatory requirements are you, you got to have it and you got to know it's safe. Uh, so you can use this request portal um, as a centralized area to be able to add new equipment into your inventory and get that process started. Um, and the converse of that is is an inventory listing. Um, departments are often um, inspected or surveyed, and they have to be able to provide um, listings of assets in their in their particular department. Um, so, using a request portal to allow that um, that inventory to be produced and then either saved as a PDF or printed or however they want to want to handle that. You know, again, that should be part of that centralized request management portal. Next. Uh, continue on down, uh, imaging and radiology, same thing. Uh, I know a lot of departments handle this manually because uh, they, they, they feel that there's not a lot of um, adequate CMMS capabilities with the immediate notifications and all that, but that's part of the routing, right? When you have uh, a piece of equipment that needs immediate service or immediate attention, then your, your process should be able to receive that request and know Here's the team that we got to notify. It's got to be done immediately so that uh, we can react to it. Um, and imaging and radiology can have that accomplished in, uh, in their CMMS uh, pretty easily in most cases. Um, on the right side is uh, another version of a CE request for HTM. Uh, again, you know, it could be communicate information at the top, uh, clearly define what's required and what's not, um, provide a, a flow from top to bottom, start to finish. Uh, and, and this right here will also do that. And next. And it's not single department. A request management portal should involve requests, as I said earlier, for all departments. Uh, not just HTM and, and imaging, but why not IT? Why not uh, facilities management? Um, 
why not uh, key requests for security? Um, earlier you saw some icons for linens and room cleaning from EBS and all those, really what you're talking about doing is using technology to increase efficiency and accuracy uh, by allowing your team, your staff, your customers to know this is where I go, right here. Okay. And some of them, as you might see in the bottom of the HFM request, you can actually embed jumps to other uh, applications inside of the, the request. Um, you know, maybe I have multiple requests I have to put in, so you, you can give your customer a more efficient way of jumping between those, those forms. Next. Um, and that's, um, we wanted to give you some real world examples. Everything you saw there is actual in place working request forms that customers use to, um, to centralize and distribute e um, service requests from all departments um, and allowing their staff to know that I go to this one spot and the, the increase of, of getting everything that's, that's needed to be solved inside the environment of care is much greater. All right, thanks, Rick. Um, you know, a couple of things I want to call out here uh, too is, is first of all, by having a, a process like this in place, um, you can identify what pretty readily what demand is, and, and so, um, you know, again, if you're looking at at uh, um, capital, it's it's not just um, how much are you spending, but what are you spending it on, and is it based on real need? or perceived need. Um, going back to the, the rentals, there's there's an appropriate use of rentals. Uh, one great example is specialty beds. You don't wanna own a bunch of specialty beds, you just don't use them uh, all that often, so when you do need them, um, you, you rent them, right? I, I think most people do that and it's an appropriate use of rentals. Um, peak census, right, so you, you have uh, what you need for for normal census and maybe a little bit more than that, but uh, you know if if you know at a time like like we're in where a lot of beds are full, uh, you need additional equipment. Uh, that's the appropriate use of rentals, but not not uh, running a bunch of stuff when you already have uh, things in your system, but nobody knows where they are. The other thing I wanted to call out is the fact that. Um, during the pandemic, many organizations purchased a lot of additional equipment, and there should be a way to track demand for those assets as well as a good process uh, to get them where they need to be and then get them back uh, for cleaning and, and processing uh, between patients. So let's walk through some of the results. Um, and I anonymized some of these organizations, but th this was uh, a 750 bed academic medical center with three hospital towers and outpatient clinics. They reduced their cost by one and a half million dollars in less than a year um, through reducing spend on dialysis machines uh, and bladder scanners because they were able to uh, track uh, equipment and make better use of what they had. Um, they uh, insourced in the wound vax uh, and saved two hundred thousand dollars annually. Um, the, again, I talked about that evidence-based demand data to uh, purchase thirty-nine bladder scanners instead of what had been planned for, which was a hundred that uh, nursing administration uh, called out as a, as a need. Um, again, using evidence-based demand. Uh, justified purchasing 13 Dallas machines instead of 30. Um, and then earlier I talked about uh, passive RFID readers and they deployed uh, 200 passive RFID readers and um, with over 20,000 passive tags to fully automate their mobile medical equipment distribution um, and, and increase their equipment availability. An, a six, another hospital system, a 604 bed academic medical center with a level one trauma center, uh, instantly avoided $750,000 annual uh, by not outsourcing equipment distribution. Um, some of our customers pay in excess of $50,000 a month for that service. Um, new Sky Tower led to uh, technology investment on IV pumps. Um, and they they knew uh, what what they needed based on on the the demand, um, 
and then uh, they utilized passive RFID uh, on, on pumps and RFID readers so that they knew uh, how much equipment was in any given space um, in, in clean utility rooms and dirty utility rooms and that drove uh, an optimum process for the, the people that were responsible for delivering that equipment. And as a result, they purchased 100 fewer pumps than they would have otherwise. Uh, there was a 407 bed hospital. They eliminated the need to purchase lost equipment. Again, this goes back to the, the uh, transmit telemetry transmitter. Uh, they had 42 that uh, they had to replace at $5,000 each. And um, you know, the, the eliminate that cost, and, and it's significant if if you're uh, doing that consistently. In this case, it was uh, two hundred and ten thousand dollars in savings. Uh, Three hundred thirteen bed academic medical center, uh, also a top twenty uh, children's hospital according to U.S. News and World, Re World Report, with thirty one locations. Uh, avoided an offsite cost center and call center investment. Um, along with a, a million dollars in infrastructure and staffing at 500,000 a year um, because they they were able to do this with uh, with technology and, and streamline processes. Um, they avoided building and staffing uh, and deployed mobile uh, devices to 1,500 nurses. Um, and then it supported their rec uh, service request tracking and fulfillment in real time. And then lastly, uh, a 415 bed academic medical center, another top 20 children's hospital, um, eliminated pump rentals at over 10,000 a month or 120,000 annually, which is directly in line with, with what I experienced um, and, and what I was able to do and fully automated the equipment distribution process, uh, transformed equipment management with uh, optimized workflows and eliminated hoarding and hiding of equipment. And, and trust is a key component of, of this too. Um, nurses have to have a trust level that they're going to get what they need when they do it or when they need it. That's why they that's why they hoard equipment. If you develop that trust, they don't feel that there's a need to keep stuff on on the floor. Uh, it gets processed uh, and cleaned appropriately, and it is becomes available for other departments when they need it. So uh, just to, to wrap up here, the, the benefits are having a connected op, uh, operational departments, uh, equipment loss prevention strategy, optimize equipment distribution, uh, eliminating equipment fishing expeditions by clinical staff, um, eliminating equipment hoarding on the floors, quickly locate assets for plan maintenance, and this is where it benefits your staff productivity. Uh, eliminate overbuying and optimizing uh, forecasted purchase needs, staying in compliance with 100% PM completion uh, rates, increasing patient and staff satisfaction, and lastly, decreasing or eliminating the cross-contamination due to ineffective cleaning of equipment on the floors. And so with that, Jennifer, I will pass it back to you for Q&A. Perfect. Thank you so much, Al and Rick, for your topic today. We do have a few questions that have come in already, but as a reminder to our audience, if you have a question, please use the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. Our first question is, and you'll love this one, I already have more to do than time and people to do it. Why would I even think about taking on one more thing? Yeah, not not surprising to get that question, um, and and really what it comes down to is it goes back to uh, answering the question why. Um, and and first of all, um, let me be clear: uh, I I would never expect anyone to do uh, any of this type of work without the adequate amount of resources, both financial and and staffing, to do it. Um, I also want to call out uh, the fact that. Um, there are organizations that you can partner with to help you uh, do this this type of work. Um, you know, in in the the uh, program that I built out, um, I, I happen to partner um, 
with, with a, 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 an RTLS company that had uh, software and, and, and processes that they could bring in. Um, but it was, it was really, it was me who got the process started by having the discussion with uh, um, our, my clinical leadership. And, you know, it, it, it's really about bringing greater value to your organization. And, and um, I mean, my guess is that you want a higher level of vis visibility within your organization and to become known as somebody who uh, understands the challenges of your organization and are part of the solution in solving those problems. Thank you so much. And our next question is, I understand the logic and potential cost savings associated with higher equipment utilization, but would that also, would that not also reduce the lifespan of that equipment and increase the number of repairs? Yeah, gr great question. And uh, if you think about it, um, Equipment wasn't designed to operate just 40% of the time. Um, and I, I often liken it to uh, my own experiences with radiographic equipment. So a, a CT and an ER uh, gets used a, a ton more than, than a, a CT in a, in a clinic, right? But um, do you have, uh, I mean, other than the, the, the tube replacement, which is based on number of slices. Um, I haven't seen uh, an increase in the, in the number of, of repairs. So that has not ever been my experience. And again, I'll, I'll go back to the idea that equipment was designed to, to be run hard. All right, our next question is, I've been in situations where I took on responsibility and budget for a function like this, but didn't have control over the people who were delivering the service, and it did not go well. How does one steer clear of that type of situation? Yeah, another great question, and, and I think what it comes down to is uh, uh, it's part of the business plan, and uh, I always developed along with that a charter which clearly outlines who is accountable for what, and then developing uh, regular metrics to support that, to make sure that you're you're meeting those those uh, service levels and and expectations. Because then, if if it happens where you're not, then you know where the problem lies. And and again, because it's part of your business plan you will have executive support for holding the right people accountable. Um, I, you know, and I, I, I have uh, customers who have been in, the, in that exact situation that you describe and um, you know, it, what, it, what it took was sort of hitting a reset button and going back and, and doing what I just described is, is to uh, develop that higher level of accountability with regular uh, reports and dashboards that will um, clearly show you on an ongoing basis uh, where you're meeting expectations and where you aren't. Okay, one more question before we wrap up, and that is, of all the examples shared, how many of them were brought to fruition through the use of consultants outside companies or multidisciplinary projects not driven by the HTM department? Well, I, I guess um, I would say none of them. And, and what, what I mean by that is um, I, I consider us a, a consultative uh, group, but um, you know what 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 we did uh, was was we went in and helped with the the uh, current state um, process e evaluation and and then made recommendations uh, based on that uh, in the organizations that I worked in um, 
you know, I, I drove a lot of this and, and was the one that put together the business plan, but um, I, I did engage um, a warepoint it was the 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 company that we we used at, at that time and and I engaged them to uh, help out with with uh, some of that that consulting and, and again it's I, I liken it to um, you know imaging services uh, you you are all responsible for imaging service in, in your organization, but do you turn the wrenches yourself? Some of you do, I'm, I'm sure, but many of you uh, manage that service and, and that's okay, right? Um, when I, when I'm, what I'm proposing here is that you do that, you do manage that service and get that ball rolling because you do understand that there's a clinical need that isn't being met and and you're the the you're the the change agent that is is helping your organization solve that. And and I I talk about this all the time that we at our core are problem solvers, and these are just different problems that need to be solved. Thank you, Al and Rick, for your time today and for a great presentation. I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the services they provide to our industry. Please visit accruent.com. A quick reminder that you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed to you one hour after the end of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit from the ACI and you'll be able to download your certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back next week with another webinar. Please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a great day.